Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Happy Even After podcast. I am Renee Bauer, your host, and I am so super excited for today's guest. So I'm going to just jump right in and introduce her so we can start talking. My guest today is Kara Golden, who is the founder and CEO of Hint Inc., best known for its amazing Hint Water, which I have right here with me. She uh, is a fortune named Kara, one of the most powerful women entrepreneurs in America. She's an active speaker and has her own podcast called The Kara Golden Show. And she's the author of a new book that just released entitled Undaunted. But when she started her company, she had four kids under the age of six. And this is my favorite story. On the way to the hospital to have your fourth child, you actually stopped at Whole Foods to ask the manager to put your water in his store. So that's like, that's amazing. Uh, So her story isn't one of an Ivy League education or connections that helped her rise to the top, but rather one of grit and determination. And her book is all about overcoming doubts and doubters. And it just released. I read it in two days. I absolutely loved it. And I am so excited to have you here talking about it. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks for the kind words. Really really excited to be here. So one of the first things in your book that jumped out to me that was just like a super fun read, and I could almost picture you doing this, you had just graduated from college, wasn't in Ivy League school, you needed a job, and you literally like knocked on doors, hit up customers at the restaurant that you worked at, and like showed up at an office building and said, give me a job. Like where the heck did that come from? Cause that's so much more than like a college degree. That's a piece of paper, but what you put out there ha- is, is so much more. Oh, so funny. It's still my favorite restaurant in Phoenix, at the TP. It's like the best Mexican. I have cravings for it all the time, but it's, um, but yeah, I mean, basically I, I felt like you know, it all kind of started with one conversation where, you know, I was waitressing to get myself through school and this guy would come in there and he was, he kind of was back like every month and he'd come in and, and sometimes he'd have friends with them. Sometimes he just came in for great margaritas or Mexican food. (laughs) And, and so after a while, you know, he's super nice and remembered me. And after a while he was, um, he said, oh, you know, where, where do you go to school? Like, are you graduating? And I said, yeah, I'm graduating. And, and um, he said, what do you want to do? And I was just like, I don't know. Like, I have no idea, you know, what I want to do. And I told him, you know, I was a minor in finance and a journalism major. And I wanted to do something that I, you know, love doing every single day. And I didn't know any further than that. And so he told me about his um, job and why he was in Arizona so frequently because he was working on getting products on movie sets. And again, I'm a college student. I'm like, really? Like Anheuser Busch has a job like that? Like that sounds great. <laughs> like I was like, you know, super, right? <laughs> I mean, imagine you're that age, right? You're 21. I'm like, wow, like whole new world, <laughs> like opened up to me. And so I was like, can I get a job doing that? And kind of joking, but somewhat serious. And he said, yeah, I can get you an interview. And that's really what sparked this idea that I should just start asking people, like, what do you do? You know, and it wasn't like a judgment. It was a curiosity, right? Where I was just like, you know, and again, I didn't like, you didn't sit down at my table and I said, what do you do? Like, it was just, you know, people that just kept coming in after a while. And so what I found was, you know, that a lot of these people actually wanted to help me, right? Like they'd be coming in. I mean, Phoenix and Scottsdale is uh, obviously like a melting pot for people coming in and spring training was, uh, was going on at the time. So people would come in from all over the U.S. But what I found was that because I had no idea and I actually shared with them that I was open to a lot, they would say, well, yeah, if you're ever in the Chicago area, like, you know, show up and, um, and I'll like, <laughs> have you interview. And so I ended up going and, um, you know, it won't ruin the whole story from the book, but I ended up getting a plane ticket. And, um, and basically I knew before I left that I was going to go from Phoenix to LA, San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, and New York, and spend like a month and doing that. 
And, um, and as I started telling people that I was like going on this journey, they're, they're like, oh, you know, you can stay at my parents' house. You should talk to my friend who works at McKinsey. Like, and what I found like those 30 days, I not only was traveling by myself and, you know, and learned so much about myself mm -hmm. and had so much confidence in myself by the end of it, but I was also just ears, you know, why, like, you know, I was listening to every single thing because I think the problem when you graduate from college, I think, is that, you know, you're trained, but you don't really know what these jobs are. Like you kind maybe you know right. what the mailroom is or an executive assistant, but you don't really know like what a, you know, sales training program is and what it entails. And so I think I had like, because I really knew nothing and I was willing to own the fact that I knew nothing. Um, I, there were so many people that were just really kind uh, along the way and also like loved my curiosity. I mean, I went in prepared. I was like, you know, very like serious about it. And um, I had over 90 job over inter interviews. Wow. And this is at a time when the market was not great. Um, you know, my husband actually graduated from a, a, a little Ivy school. And, you know, as he said, when he met me, he was like, you know, how'd you get a job? Like, I mean, this is it's crazy because he was sort of, again, I talk about it a little bit more and kind of the purpose of my book, but he had this wall up in front of him and people actually told him that, oh, it's a tough job market. Like you can't do it. And I, you know, nobody told me that. And I really like just kept going and leading. And I think that's an important message, you know, for people to hear today too, you know, because obviously people are all, you know, on Zoom right now and doing virtual meetings and the number of kids that I've met that, you know, are graduating from school, they're like, oh, I can't possibly find a job. I'm like, no, you, you actually can. Like you're, you know, you can do it. It's just, it's a choice, right? And you have to be like, you have to figure out where those roles are. And that doesn't just apply to college students. Like I think if there's a will, there's a way. And I also think that if you, you know, go into a situation and you don't try and be the smartest one in the room or, you know, the most knowledgeable, which is the case, you know, when I built Hint, um, was really like, it was, a, it was an advantage that I didn't come from, you know, the beverage industry because I was able to like go in and say, I've done a lot of other stuff in tech and built some pretty incredible businesses, but I know nothing about the beverage industry. And I'm so excited that you're going to take the time to like talk to me about it. And there were a few people who were like, I don't have time to have this conversation. But again, it's a numbers game and you have to just have grit and have resilience to just keep going. And, you know, and then as soon as I felt like along the way that I would, you know, whether it was interviewing for a job after college or, in my journey, you know, and building Hint, as soon as I found that, you know, something great would happen, I would hold that. And I'd say, okay, I want to go find another great moment, right? Where it's like, now it's like my lucky time. And so I'm going to, you know, keep going. And, and I think that, you know, that is really, you know, what people need to be reminded about is that the, you know, dark doesn't always sit there. Like if it's not going your way, you have to go out and find your opportunities. And that's great advice for right now, because there's plenty of dark and plenty of opportunities for people to pivot. So you say in your book, no means maybe, and maybe means yes. Can you talk about that? And what is one of the hardest no's that you've ever had to overcome or turn into a yes? Yeah. So, you know, it's a, it's an interesting thing because obviously it has very, you know, a few years ago was a very serious conversation, particularly for women, but um, not related to that. My, you know, my dad used to really have this opinion about me that my resilience was, you know, really whenever he would say, maybe I would think, okay, there's like a little bit of opening <laughs> and I just have to work it like a little longer. And, you know, I was, I was the last of five kids. I was, it, I was, uh, you know, I didn't think about, I, I didn't think this way at the time, but I had two brothers who were pretty naughty that were older than me, one significantly older. And then my parents like had a break from that. And then they had three more kids um, and I was the youngest. And so, 
um, they were really good at saying no. Like I would be like, oh, can I go to that party? No. Like I'd be like, like, why? And then, you know, and what can I do? Which is another thing I talk about in the, in the book. And so, uh, so whenever, you know, maybe kind of came up, I thought, oh, there's like an opportunity there to like, they're sort of open to it. And then when it was no, I was like, why? Like, come on. And, and so, you know, if you have that kid at home who is, you know, like annoying you, right? That is saying, why, why, why? Like that was me. And I was like, and I really look at it now as, um, you know, I still ask why. And, and in building a company and, you know, today we're the, you know, largest non-alcoholic beverage in the country that doesn't have a relationship with Coke or Pepsi. I mean, you know, everybody said it couldn't happen. And, you know, I think along the way, I just kept, you know, I kept going, but I, but I also kept my, you know, questions going and my curiosity, mm -hmm. um, which I think is, you know, it starts young. It starts with, you know, somebody, you know, I can't say that my dad always answered my questions, you know, but I, I kept asking, like, <laughs> why not? Right. And I just kept going. And, and I think also I appreciated, um, you know, the, the idea of, of really just, it was okay if somebody said maybe every once in a while, because I, I, like I said, I, it was, it was a, it was a time when, you know, I could hopefully convince them um, to, to change their mind a bit. So I guess the real question is, do your kids use that on you then? Do they know like a no can still easily convert to a yes if they push you hard enough? Yeah. I mean, I think, that's true, um, that they <laughs> definitely do. Um, you know, I think like the other piece that I'll say, I was sharing with an entrepreneur the other day that I started this company with four kids under the age of six. And, you know, I'm not going to lie. It was crazy town, right? Around my house, mm -hmm. like at times. And I had help that came in, but, you know, it was still like by the afternoon when I was like, like the great news is, is in starting a company, you can kind of make your own hours. So I still wanted to go do mommy and me classes and do that stuff. And, and so I would do that in the afternoon. And then, you know, I would have dinner, make dinner, and then I would, um, you know, come back on at night and I would adjust that. And I think that, um, you know, my kids have grown up seeing a mom that has grit and works really hard. And, you know, now I, I have three in college, I can't even believe it. And, you know, one that's a sophomore in high school and, you know, they're all very, four very different kids, very independent, um, but they've grown up in a house there where, you know, they've, they've seen not only a woman actually run a company and take on like an a huge industry and it wasn't supposed to happen and their memories of you know the challenges along the way um you know we they could we couldn't help but share when there's frustrations along the way and you know one of the big soda companies is throwing out all of our product in the dumpster you know like just things like that along the way that they're all ears right yeah. they listen and they absorb the stuff and so it wasn't until a few years ago that I really started, you know, to hear, especially from teachers that, you know, they really, they, they just get it. Like they understand like the challenges of business. They understand equity in companies. They understand, mm -hmm. you know, how do you build a company culture, the importance, like they, they really, all four of them, you know, have a good grasp on that stuff. And so I think it's, it's um, as I was sharing with this um, entrepreneur who has very young kids, it's like, it, it is hard when, mm -hmm. when they're young. And I can only imagine trying to homeschool kids oh, through I this, know. right. And do all that. But I do believe that, you know, you, you teach, you teach kids, you know, they, they're watching and they see it and, you know, and it's something that ultimately you make them not only potential entrepreneurs, but also people that, you know, hopefully go and work hard and, you know, yeah. and understand that, you know, they, they're, they're not entitled and, mm -hmm. you know, and that they have to, you know, sometimes, as I always say to my kids, like, 
you know, there's days I try not to, but there's days I scrub toilets, you know, and mm -hmm. it's like, you have to do some things Absolutely. along the way. And I think that that's a really, really important lesson for kids to see parents doing as well. Right. And you were moving pallets and delivering product yourself at the beginning, yeah. right? Well, and even during the pandemic, I mean, you know, the story in March and, you know, I'll never forget it on March 13th, I was flying back from New York actually. And my son asked me to stop at Target. Um, I live in the Bay Area, just outside of San Francisco. And so Target's open till 11 o'clock at night. And he asked me to stop there. And, you know, I always like to go and we have like 16 feet of space in Target. And um, so I always like to go in there and sort of check out what our sales team is doing. And I went into one Target store um, that was right by the San Francisco airport and there was no product in stock at all. And I walked in the back room, um, which is another thing like my kids have you know, just gotten used to me. Like there's like managers are running after me. I'm like, Oh, I, I like work here. Don't worry about me. And my kids just are like, Oh my God, this is so embarrassing. And so I walk in the back room and there's no back stock at all. And typically, um, you know, the big stores like a target, um, will actually order off of register data. So when you go up to pay for something, they actually, you know, if it gets too low, they'll be, um, ordering. And, um, and there was not a bottle in the store. And so I was freaking out, right? Like on the one hand, you're really excited to see like, oh, the product's all gone. And then you're like, there won't be any sales this whole weekend, right? right? Heading into a pandemic, right? Which was really bad. And I'm like, where is it? Where's the product? And basically the, you know, a lot of companies are starting to talk about this, but the, you know, the software systems just broke. I mean, it, it was just overloaded and these stores could not replenish fast enough. And so, you know, this was happening in multiple stores. And that weekend we made some, you know, big decisions, including sending truckloads into stores and kind of bypassing distributors in order to do that. And, you know, with that, we needed people to actually mm -hmm. go in from our team and really just help. And so we very quickly, within a couple of days, reallocated. And we not only maintained our space, but we also gained space. And I, you know, have been working through the entire pandemic. And, you know, friends would call me. They're like, is it really bad in the stores? And, and I'm, I'm like, if you go before 7 o'clock in the morning, it's not that bad. You know, it's like there's no people in there. Right. So I would, like, have all these strategies that I would bring up. Um, but I think... I, I think, um, you know, the core thing that we were able to do and I was able to do, you know, maybe it's going back to my waitressing days is that I can stay scrappy, right? Yeah. And I can stay and I can go back there and, you know, I can like walk into a Target store now and the, the running joke is uh, when I ended up, I was in the beginning was talking to a Target employee and um, and he was asking about a guy who works in Marin County where I live and where I was helping out this guy, Ben. And he was like, where's Ben? And of course everybody was, you know, wondering, did he get furloughed? Did he get sick? Like, why isn't he here? And I said, oh, I'm just helping out. And he said, what do you do uh, for the company? And I said, oh, I've worked here forever. Don't worry, Ben's just, he's coming back <laughs> in tomorrow. And then after a few minutes, I just thought, okay, this is a really annoying conversation. And, you know, poor guy, I said, um, I'm actually the founder of the company he was like wait what and he's like that's crazy and i was like i know it's crazy and he was like you're working you're and i said mm. yeah i'm you know and and he was like can i have your autograph on my bottle and you know and so ben's like you can't go away you have to like keep coming into stores and i'm like no it's it's great but i i do think it's a you know I, I feel like that actually sent a message to the team too, that okay. it's, you know, I'm going to be watching out for you guys too and building this. And, and, you know, you talked about grit earlier, but I also think it's about, um, you know, the other thing that the book touches on is I've worked in a lot of different cultures. And when I was finally able to start my own company, I knew, you know, what I wanted in a company. Yeah. And I think like that's, um, you know, another piece of it that we talk about and I, you know, want managers to be able to, you know, 
move as they need to and get scrappy and, you know, player coach kind of mentality. I think it's important. You have a chapter in your book called Know When to Move On. And I think you talk about, you had some amazing opportunities presented to you from really some of the top companies in the country, if not world, but you chose to get scrappy and kind of dig deep and find your passion. So how, how does someone know when to move on? And I think that can be not just a business question, but in life and leaving the job or leaving the marriage or leaving whatever their current circumstance is that really isn't feel, feeling good or fit in them anymore. Yeah. I mean, I, I think first of all, there's a few different things that I look for. And one is you know, if you're just not really enjoying it anymore yeah. and right, like there's just, your personality has changed. You're just not, I don't know, maybe you can't sleep anymore. I don't know. I've never had a problem sleeping. So that, that is not for me, but I, I think for me, it was just, it, there was also an aspect of, um, I didn't feel like I was learning and, uh, you know, I left AOL um, so I was in the tech industry before, for those of you who don't know my backstory. And, um, and then I decided to start this company hint, which is a water company. And for me, when I was, you know, leaving AOL, I felt like I was, you know, one of the youngest vice presidents in the company. I was, um, you know, one, one of few females, I wasn't the only female, but one of few females. And I was traveling a ton, um, going back and forth between San Francisco and, and Virginia and New York. And I really like felt like um, my role was kind of to manage people versus actually um, kind of having, you know, this, this like player coach sort of mentality mm -hmm. that, um, and it, like it was in the beginning, I felt like now it was like, okay, you know, a couple hundred people and they're all asking me, like, okay, what do I do next? And so, um, and, and so, you know, I didn't realize this until later. And this is something that I share with, you know, managers in our company today, which is like always hire people that actually are going to teach you something. Hmm. And that can be like as simple as like, teach you Twitter or, you know, like something, right. it could not even be like related, but something that engages you in some way that you think is like, you know, okay, I'm going to learn like some things. And because ultimately that keeps you, even as you grow, you know, up the organization, um, that keeps you engaged, right? Like, and you, you should always be learning. So if you're not in a position where you are learning and frankly, I think it's the same with your personal life. If you just yeah. don't feel like you're learning and you're just like constantly like, I don't know, cooking or, you know, or doing the laundry and there's just nothing. Like, I think that like try and figure out a way that you can be learning again. Right. And, and exploring things. Cause I, again, like, you know, I really do believe that that's what I've seen in my life where it starts to get, you know, it, like I get cranky, right? Yeah. If I'm not, if I'm not <laughs> learning in some way. And so, um, so that's one of the stories in the book too, is it, and again, I, I think it's something that I've shared with so many leaders as well as managers is like hire people that are doing something that, you know, you don't know how to do, or they're smarter than you or something like that. Just because you're a manager, that doesn't yeah. mean you have to be, you know, the smartest person in the room, right? And I think this goes true for, you know, kind of where I saw myself. I felt like I had learned the tech industry and, you know, and I, I wouldn't say like I knew everything, but in my world, I knew a lot of it. And a lot of people were asking me, how do I do this? How do I do this? And I felt like I want to go into it. I, I want to go do something where I'm, you know, not the expert. I want to, I want to go learn like, and I actually even looked at going to business school and I thought like, maybe that's where I could do this. And that, that's when, you know, I, I was talking to somebody yesterday about this. I mean, it's pretty funny. Most of my friends were in tech at the time. And so I would talk to them about starting this beverage company and they were like, wait, what? Like, what are you doing? You know? And, and so, you know, one of the things that, 
I also share with people too is as an entrepreneur, and particularly if you're, you know, doing something that's kind of against the grain of what the rest of your community is doing, like it can be really lonely, yeah. right? Like, and, and it's like, and it's real and you've got to, you know, I kept thinking like, oh, I have to go find people that are in the beverage industry and, you know, and that tribe, like, didn't really want me there because mm. I wasn't like, I hadn't grown up in CPG. I was just this crazy tech lady that was coming into their industry. That was annoying. <laughs> Tell, right? Telling them that you could do it better. <laughs> yeah, that I could, yeah, that I, that I, or like I was wasting their time. And that, and that is the thing, you know, that I learned along the way too, where, you know, the, the, the people that you learn from don't necessarily have to be you know, doing exactly what you're doing either. Like the industry experts are yeah. not necessarily, you know, the people that like force you to learn. And you can actually, the fundamentals of business, right? Like if you're a, if you're a you know, rising star in finance and you eventually want to be like a CFO of a company, you don't have to just like hang out with people in your industry who are in right. finance, right? Like you may actually learn tips and tricks from, you know, if you're in a services business or you're right. in, you know, widgets, right? You're like, it's just matters that they're widgets and they matter. And, and it's kind of interesting to hear how a services business might be different from a widgets kind of thing. And so that's what I learned. It's like, you know, the more time that you can kind of get out of your circle and get out of your own head to like, you know, you can actually learn a lot and you may actually put a different slant on growing your business. Which brings me to your favorite, my favorite quote from your book. It's if you think too much about the end, you'll never get past the beginning. And mm -hmm. I think that that's perfect because that's where people get stuck. It's that first step. And it's, it's the, well, what if this fails? What if I, I, you know, I, I can't do it. What if yeah. all of like the what ifs and, and you're just saying push past all of them and say, screw it, do it anyway, figure out how to do it. And when someone tells you no, do it anyway, which brings yeah. me to my, one of the, my, I can't say favorite stories, but it's one of the stories in your book that made me like, er, like really ticked me off is you were um, talking to a Coca-Cola executive and I think he essentially told you like, haha, like you can't do it. And then he ended that by calling you sweetie. So yeah. how did that like ignite a fire to like prove him wrong? Well, it, it was crazy. I mean, it was shocking. I, it was at a time when I thought, wow, there's so much I don't know about this industry. And, you know, I, I had my doubts. I mean, my book is, is called Undaunted Overcoming Doubts and Doubters. And, and a lot of, you know, what I talk about is that I absolutely had my doubts and, you know, and this was definitely one of them. And a friend said, I couldn't figure out like how to actually produce our product and get, you know, more shelf life um, that was needed for some of our stores that we were going into and, and also distribution. And so a friend said, Oh, you know, I met this person once, like you should, you should like, I'll reach out and see if I can make the introduction. And I was like, Oh, that's great. I didn't even know when I finally connected with him that I would say this, but um, you know, I was sharing how well we were doing in the Bay Area. We had gotten it into a bunch of stores and, you know, sort of some of my challenges. And I said, listen, um, you know, I think this probably is better for you to take this company on because you guys know a lot more than I do. And you can just like have this company. Thank God and, you didn't do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and uh, so his response was, you know, sweetie, Americans love sweet. Uh, this company isn't going anywhere. And I was like, wait, what? Like, what, what did he just say to me? And, um, you know, and I kept making excuses for like, what did he just say? And then finally, after like two minutes, I, I tuned back in and I realized then that here I really, you know, was looking at this person in the soda industry that I really viewed as expert, right? Mm. And, um, and I kind of wanted his approval, right, in some way. And then what I realized is that he was on a totally different mission. I mean, my mission, the hint for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is an unsweetened flavored water. So we don't have any sweeteners. There's no diet sweeteners. Um, and that was really 
you know, my challenge that I had overcome after, you know, really being addicted to diet, diet Coke for so long. And so I felt like I was sharing this, like, you know, epiphany with him about this, you know, this not starting with me, but also that there were other people out there that really wanted water that just tasted better, that didn't have all these sweeteners in it. And, you know, what I quickly realized was that he believed that this, that the consumer should just be like tricked into, you know, into like, thinking that something was healthy. I'd now call it like healthy perception versus healthy reality. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was actually trying to get people healthier because I had seen by giving up diet soda and drinking water with just some fruit in it that I had lost over 20 pounds in two and a half weeks when I first, and then after six months, lost 50 pounds. I mean, it was life-changing, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought just by drinking all these diet sweeteners, like people just mm -hmm. don't know that. Right. You know? that that's, um, that that's the case. So, so, you know, he wasn't really interested in that because he had been sort of trained to actually like try and figure out how to get around this and, and never did the word mm -hmm. health like come up. And so, you know, in this few minute conversation, I found it very, very disturbing. And I thought, and that was like the moment that I'm so thankful for because I got off the phone and I really like believed if I didn't actually, I felt like I had been gifted this mission. And this is another thing that I share with people constantly. It's like, if you're the only one thinking about this, like that's okay, right? As long as you believe and try and get your product out there as quick as possible, you don't need confirmation from everybody that it's a great idea. What you need is you need to actually figure out whether or not like people will buy it or people will use it, whatever, you know, depending on what it is, because they may not actually like have your vision, right? For, for what it is or see like that it solved a problem like it did mine. And, and instead, I think like the quicker you can get your product or service out to market to sort of show people, you know, like, here's what it is. Like, are you interested? And then you'll see, you know, and you'll always adjust and change things along the way. Um, but anyway, I, I think like there's, there's such an important lesson there where, you know, so many people think like, oh, you know, the big company guy like told me that it was like a bad idea or somebody that had been in the industry for so long. When you look at, you know, great companies that have been built, whether it's, you know, Apple or, or Hint or Spanx or, you know, Facebook or, or whatever it is along the way. Like nobody was telling those people immediately right. that it was a great idea. Like there were plenty of people who had been sort of trained to say like five reasons why it's not right. a great idea. And so I really think it was a gift to me to sort of like go. And that's what I did that day was just go and build. Did you send him a case of your water when it came out? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't. I mean, it, it's funny, you know, only until recently. I mean, we're now in 30,000 stores, um, but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we really, it, it's, it's a longer story, but I mean, that, that was like another piece of this that I really was um, kind of like eyes wide open to was the, the power that you know the soda industry really has over consumers and stores. So you know, for we started 15 years ago. I mean, we really didn't have much traction in Atlanta until kind of recently. I mean, it was just it was you know really kind of depressing, hmm. like how much you know soda was living yeah. in the city. And and I think that it's um, you know it's it's pretty sad right? Yeah. Like consumers actually think like, oh, it must be, you know, like the most popular or whatever. It's like, there's blocks all right. over the place. And it's not just the soda industry. It's the food industry. You know, it's the ice cream industry. I mean, it's like, you know, right. it's constant. And so, you know, I always share with friends when they've come to, you know, the Expo West, which is a big food show or the fancy food show, like they're like, oh my gosh, there's all these companies. And I said, I, I always get a little depressed like knowing, you know, that there's so many little companies here and most of them will never make it to market mm. because, you know, that maybe they don't have the grit or they don't, you know, 
they sort of like haven't been able to figure out how to navigate through it because the games that go on in the food and beverage industry and ultimately the the consumer loses right so let's let's talk about your book for a moment as we're wrapping up our time together because i i just really want to i want listeners to really understand how powerful it is and it's more than just um about the food and beverage industry i mean it yeah. is such a journey your book is a journey from beginning to where you are and you know you know that that journey is still going to continue and it, the stories are so good and it's it's funny you know it's you Thank definitely you. <laughs> like there's moments that i laugh so what inspired you to write it so I've been speaking for the last few years on really building the company and, you know, being a female entrepreneur and, and, um, and always at these events, there's always the Q and a, not always, but I'd say 95% of the time. And these questions would come up that would almost turn into statements from people mm -hmm. saying things like, you know, you're obviously very confident. You've like, never had any failures, you, you know, worked at great places along the way. And, um, and what I realized is that there's so many walls around people that they put up for themselves and like reasons why they can't do it. And, um, and I wanted people to hear through my stories um, that I've overcome a ton of stuff, um, but not like that's not the purpose of the book. The purpose is that hopefully they will read these stories and say, you know, she did it. So why can't I? And I feel like I remember um, a few years back, uh, I was on this segment for how I made my millions. It used to be, I think it was on uh, uh, MSN or CNBC. And, um, and it was fascinating. I must have run into people like just drinking hint at like a hotel, you know, whatever, sitting by the pool a few times. But I remember this one time where a woman came up to me and asked me where I got the hint. And I told her Harris Teeter a supermarket in the South. And, <laughs> and, um, she but said, you probably hand delivered the bottles too. <laughs> I, I didn't, but I, you know, when I, my poor kids, whenever we're on vacation, they're always like, you know, I'm always going to the grocery store and trying to, try to see what's going on in there. And um, anyway, and so it was interesting because she told me the story of me and like, and she had seen the segment and she didn't realize it was me. And, you know, I've got red hair. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I think, I would be recognizable, but she didn't recognize me. And, uh, and what I realized in, you know, her telling the story was that she, you know, went on to not only share the story with me, but I'll also say like, oh, it's really inspiring. You should definitely watch it. Like I started thinking about my life and uh, all the times that I've been thinking about products that maybe I should go do. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, I, you know, I really thought about that it's not just about the building of hints um, that, you know, people might be inspired by, but also knowing that, you know, I came from a super middle class family. I, you know, like I had never been to New York before I moved there, like, and, you know, tried to get a job in a time when I wasn't supposed to get a job. You know, we've done things. We just raise money for our company and you know over zoom like in the midst of you know a time when everybody said nobody's going to be able to raise money like just i i just see opportunities and i just keep going right oh, and i, I think people need to hear that yes. and and you know and and know you know also having a family you know too that there's moments i mean there's days when people are like how do you have balance i'm like some days I'm not balanced, yeah. right? I'm really not. And it's not a good thing. And I'm also very, people are, you know, have called me authentic. I'm like, no, I just say it as it is, right? Like, yeah. and, and that's the thing. It's like sort of lessons. I, hopefully you, you felt those in there too, where, you know, I don't work with unkind people, right? Like mm -hmm. I just, I, you know, and I think, that that's just another really important thing, you know, to share with people as well that, you know, you just, 
you just have to know your boundaries and you have to, you know, know what you ultimately want to do. And, and, you know, it's really rare that, um, unfortunately I, I feel like we either hear that, you know, women are women who are starting companies are unicorns. Like we're like, and then they're somehow good or, you know, their company fails along the way. And I think there's like this in between of saying, no, she's actually like, kind of, I mean, done something that I want to hear like more mm -hmm. about and it's been hard and there's grit and all those kind of things. And hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll hear more people telling their stories as well. Where do we find your book? How do we get it? How do we find and follow you? Yeah. So, um, the book is, um, obviously on Amazon too, but also on undaunted, the book doc, undaunted, the book.com. And we're always, that's a, off of our website um the hint website and so we're always offering kind of fun stuff there where um depending um you know the timing of, of it like we're constantly offering um either additional supplements to the book or sometimes a case of hint and you know we've been doing all kinds of fun free stuff over which is there awesome well. that's how i got my case of hint when i ordered my book so it's awesome <laughs> Yeah, it's it's uh it's super fun. So and I'll yeah. put that link in the show notes as well. And awesome. I have one final question for you. What is your personal favorite flavor of hint? Okay, I saw that you had the blueberry lemon, and that is a brand new flavor, wow. and it is so good. It and good. yeah, it is really, really good. But I would say if I have a refrigerator full i cherry that's is so good. hands down that's my favorite too yeah. cherry and green apple are my two go-to's yeah i love the green apple too but i think like that's the thing that's i remember the thing that was so um interesting when i first started this company i ended up meeting um the the uh founders of vitamin water early on and you know the the thing that they told me was like when people found a flavor that they liked they would just like never have anything else. Like mm. if, you, if it was formula 50, you were like the formula 50 person. Right. And what I found in building hint, which again goes to the whole, you know, topic of, you know, these industry experts or whatever people's path were, was not necessarily going to be your path, but our consumer still to this day, like, you know, if black or if blueberry lemon is not in stock, then or it's not in your refrigerator or whatever and then you're like oh i'll do cherry yeah they're all good fine. right they're yeah, all good like, I mean, people, <laughs> people do this constantly yeah and, and i think it's like fascinating because it just goes to show you that everybody you know has their own path right yeah, and it's yeah. just not really you know the case we have 26 flavors and we have wow. 26 flavors for like a reason because i think our consumer really wants variety yeah. and which is yeah. extremely like not the case when you look at like you know a diet coke consumer that's all i drank was diet coke i didn't drink like cherry coke i drank diet coke that was it yeah. right and so i think it's like you know hint has really kind of opened up um you know this whole topic of of variety and choice and and which is you know frankly i think like in sync with what people want you yeah, know, yeah. in their personal life as as well. Yeah, absolutely. That, you know, it's it's a, an important kind of topic just overall. So anyway, well, thank you so much. Thank you. I can't wait to see what's next. Uh, everyone needs to pick up this book because you guys, it's so good. Yay. It's like, it's really, and I'm not just thank saying you. that because you're on here as a guest. <laughs> like I, I mean it, I really read it in two days. Like I, at one point I closed my office door and like put my do not disturb in my phone and read like the last probably the last quarter of it. I'm like, I'm not going to have anyone bug me while I finish this. So, so nice. Thank you. So for good. <laughs> and no so problem. Much. Thank you so much. And uh, good luck with everything. And can't wait to see what the next flavor is. Yay. Thank you.